Hello, I'm Terry Hamburg, and welcome to Cypress Lawn Memorial Park, the home of some 500,000 souls, and each one has a story. Today we're going to look at two important California families, the DeYoungs and the Spreckles, the families that are responsible for building the two great museums of San Francisco, the Legion of Honor and the DeYoung. We call this murder, mayhem, and museums. Right now, we're standing under a larger-than-life statue of Charles D. Young, a man who loomed large over early San Francisco. As a young man, Charles moved to San Francisco with his family from Louisiana, and in 1865, he and his brother started a newspaper that was called the Daily Dramatic Chronicle, where he reported on show business and theater news, and then it quickly evolved into the San Francisco Chronicle that we know today. This statue was built by his brother and originally uh, placed with de Young in the Oddfellow Cemetery and moved to Cypress Lawn in 1947. You'll notice the dates on Charles Stone, he died as a very young man, age 34. So how does this happen? In Gold Rush, San Francisco, you either die from an illness, which today there would probably be a cure, or by the bullet. In the case of Charles de Young, as it turns out, that pen he is holding in his hand was not mightier than the sword. Charles de Young, was a determined man. He was short-tempered, aggressive, and wanted to pursue anti-corruption and expose stories. Six years after the newspaper was founded, he had already been sued 12 times for criminal libel. And one of his uh, enemies decided not to go through the court system at all, but to challenge him directly to a duel, which the two of them fought on a busy California street. And they each discharged two volleys, which fortunately missed each other, and even more miraculously missed the audience that had gathered or was fleeing from the spectacle. Charles de Young actually enjoyed the notoriety he was getting and seemed to thrive off the danger and the excitement. He was told to pack a pistol, and he did. His newspaper wasn't afraid of controversy either. Journalism was a blood sport in the early gold rush. The best example of this is in 1856, an editor of a prominent newspaper is assassinated by the editor of another prominent newspaper. The culprit is then tried by a vigilance committee and publicly hung eight days later. This is the world that Charles de Young inherited. In 1880, Charles de Young is locking horns with the largest minister in the city, both in terms of weight and congregation size. Reverend Isaac Kalock is going to run for mayor. De Young thinks this is a terrible idea. He's unworthy, he's corrupt, and De Young has his own candidate. After Kalock is nominated, De Young decides he has to stop him. He runs a series of articles accusing Kalock of serial adultery. This had a certain plausibility because the Reverend was known to fancy the company of young ladies. In De Young's article, he starts naming names and dates and places, some of which may even have been true. Kalock would not back down. In fact, he was emboldened by this. And he decided to answer De Young in public in front of his congregation. Yes, he admitted, I was accused of being a philanderer of adultery when I was a young lad, but I went to court and I was acquitted. Then Reverend Kalock turned his attention to the de Young brothers. And I'm going to read a bit of his sermon. It is not necessary tonight, it may be hereafter, 
to discuss the defiled organ. And he's talking about the San Francisco Chronicle. The bawdy house breeding, the gutter snipe training of this delectable pair of social pariahs, the De Young brothers, who are moral lepers, vainly struggling for the recognition which decent society denies them, and who, by a persistent, damnable system of blackmailing, have built up a newspaper which, in its every issue, is a moral volcano. So this was the poetry of the pulpit and the printing press. And I want to call your attention to one little part of it, the body house breeding. What does that mean? It meant that the de Youngs were bastards in a literal sense. We may know who their mother is because she was in a, a body house, but we don't know who the father was. Well, Young's attitude was, you can attack me, but don't attack my mother. And this drove him to a frenzy. So he could have challenged the reverend to a duel. The guy was big and probably slow, but he decided against that. Duels can be inconclusive. So instead, he devised a simple but dastardly plan. He enlisted the aid of a young lad to find Kalok, lure Kalok to a coach to speak to a young lady. As Kalok approached the coach, the young flung open the door and fired two shots point blank at Kalok, who falls to the ground. He's immediately arrested and brought to jail. An engraving of the crime scene, very lurid and detailed, is splashed across newspapers around the country. It shows Kalak grabbing his chest, the young firing the weapon, smoke coming from his gun. Once the San Francisco newspapers got it, the national press got it, and then international papers, an early 19th century example of going viral. Kalak is down, but he's not out. With enough natural insulation, to stop any bullet from penetrating vital organs, he actually goes on and he lives. Believe it or not, lo and behold, he goes on to be elected mayor while he is still in bed recovering from his wound. De Young is in jail, but this doesn't stop him. He continues his anti kalak diatribe until he is released on bail. Reverend Kalak has a son. Isaac Jr., and he is horrified by what's going on. The de Youngs are destroying his family, almost killed his father, and Charles de Young must be stopped. So he picks a night. Charles de Young is sitting in his office in the brand new Chronicle building, and Kalak sits across the street at a tavern drinking liquid courage. He walks into de Young's office pulls out his gun and starts firing. Three shots hit De Young. De Young is still alive. He reaches for his pistol and the final shot by Isaac pierces his juggler and Charles De Young is dead. Immediately, Isaac Kalak is arrested and brought to jail. At a young 34 years old, Charles de Young, one of the most successful editors in the West and known worldwide, is dead. His family has a service two days later, and then, in venerable San Francisco tradition, a lavish public funeral attended by thousands. So young Isaac Kalak goes to trial. It seems like an open and shut case, but when the verdict comes back, it is a surprise. We find the defendant innocent, Your Honor. He was acting under extreme duress and temporarily insane at the time of the assault. There is public outrage, which is mild compared to the editorial outrage, especially from Michael de Young. Eventually, the case fades away, but the de Young story doesn't end here. 
1884, a few years after the k incident, Michael DeYoung, who has taken over the newspaper from Charles, is writing a series of strong anti-corruption, anti-monopoly articles against one of the most powerful families in California, the Spreckles family. Klaus Spreckles is known as the Sugar King. And it just so happens that he is right up the road, around the corner from the de Youngs. And here we have it, the spectacular Klaus Spreckles Mausoleum. So here we are at the beautiful, magnificent Spreckles Mausoleum, one of my favorites. It's perched on a hill overlooking all of the terrain. It's sort of the Pacific Heights of Cypress Lawn. And it also has openings on all four sides. So inside, it's light and airy, unlike any other mausoleum here. But we're not here to talk about architecture. Starting from nothing, Klaus Spreckles became one of the wealthiest men in the world by building a monopoly of the sugar trade from the Hawaiian Islands. He established a series of plantations and then a shipping system to bring the sugar to the western United States. This shipping system was led by a young William Matson, who went on later in life when uh, tourism became popular in Hawaii to establish the Matson passenger steamship lines. But that's a story for another time. The power of the Spreckles family made them prime targets for an anti-corruption Michael de Young. He begins by accusing them of running slave labor on their Hawaiian plantations. When de Young accused him of bilking his stockholders, his young son, Adolf, was livid. He was ruining the family, ruining their reputation, and he decided to stop de Young. His aim was to silence him, to cut off any more articles from ever being published. But unlike Isaac Kalock's son, his aim was off. He marches into the Chronicle offices, finds Michael DeYoung, pulls out a gun, and fires a shot. The first one wings him in the elbow. The second one hits him in the shoulder. By this time, the employees hear the ruckus come running in, see Adolf, and begin to tackle him. Adolf manages to get off a third shot, and Michael, who was carrying children's books at the time, holds them up as defense. The bullet goes through the children's book, but still penetrates Michael. In the course of being tackled to the ground, Adolf is shot. Well, when all of the gunpowder settles, both men, although wounded, were still alive. Young Adolf goes to trial, and the jury comes back with its verdict. Innocent. He was acting under extreme duress and, you can fill in the blank, was temporarily insane at the time of the assault. It's a good thing that both of these men survived this incident. Good for fine arts in San Francisco. Some years later, Michael de Young, possibly to improve his reputation, decided to establish the Fine Arts Building in Golden Gate Park, which was damaged in the earthquake of 1906, restored, renovated with de Young funds, and the museum was renamed appropriately the de Young Museum. In San Francisco, philanthropy was a competitive sport. And this is a sport that Adolf is ready to follow. Years later, after the incident, he marries a beautiful, young, tall, statuesque, risque model named Ama de Bretville. 
Alma had very expensive tastes, especially in fine art, and especially in French art, and especially in Rodin sculptures, which she introduced to the United States. She was more than just a collector, she was a connoisseur. Finally, they had collected so much fine stuff in so many fine rooms, they had no place else to put it. So Alma filled this new museum with all of her treasures from all over the world. And it opened to great fanfare as the Legion of Honor in 1924. Years later, Alma de Bretville is at a society luncheon and in walk the de Young daughters. They manage a strained nod to each other. And Alma turns to her companion and says, those de Young girls are nice enough, but they've never forgiven my husband for shooting their father. So here we have this strange historical irony. On a fateful day in 1884, two men who will go on to found the two great museums in San Francisco are in the same room, one trying to kill the other, both of them shot and both of them surviving. Today, both of these museums, the Legion of Honor and the de Young, in their original locations are part of, equal parts of, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, a collaboration which would have been unimaginable back in the day. This is Terry Hamburg, this is Cypress Lawn, and thank you for joining us today.